You're watching the Video Revolution Podcast from Primo Productions. My friend, would you try for one week? Never saying anything derogatory about anything. There isn't anything that is all wrong. There really isn't, my friend. Do you ever think about that? For one month, if you would never say anything derogatory about anything, you take now even a broken clock is not all wrong. It's right twice every 24 hours. The black hole of Calcutta was easy to heat. We used to say down in Mississippi, prohibition was horrible, but it was better than no whiskey at all. I'm on the board of directors of an electronic company. And we had a meeting in San Francisco not long ago to select a guy, executive vice president, at a very high salary. And I thought I was head of the committee, and I thought we had the right guy. And one of the players said, oh, Cabot, you are not serious. Not that guy. Well, that guy's a confirmed alcoholic. The other director, bless his heart, said, well, at least he ain't no quitter. I mean, in justification for this fellow, because he speaks sometime with Merlin and me around the country, this guy brought our sales up 60%. Not only that, he is head of Alcoholic Anonymous in his town. He influences more lives in one month than I'll influence the rest of my life. Everybody likes to buy from an individual, individual who loves what he are uh, doing. One of the privileges of my life, when I was practicing law in New York City, I was with Tom Dewey in the racket investigation. Just before my health broke down and they sent me to Arizona to die. I loved old Tom Dewey. He only wanted us to wake a half a day. And he didn't care which 12 hours it was. The three doctors that sent me to Arizona to die, the most generous and only gave me six months to live. Now those 40 odd years have been the best six months of my life. Those doctors have been dead a long, long time. But Tom Dewey would take us out to lunch once a month each. I'll never forget the first time Tom Dewey took me out to lunch. August 4th, 1935. He took me down to 120 Broadway to the Bankers Club. And there I heard the person I consider the greatest human ear of this century make the last talk he ever made on this earth. Because exactly 11 days later, he and Wiley Post started around the world. And they went out in that great tragedy up in Alaska. Who is that guy? Will Rogers. Oh, the president never met a person he didn't love. Every stranger just a friend he hadn't met. You see, Will Rogers' great philosophy was, any time you do not combine a friendship experience with a business experience, you are underpaid. I remember so well how he walked out in his little characteristic walk with his hands in his pocket. His head turned on the side with that little smirk on his face. He said, folks, I don't know what you do for a living, and I couldn't care less. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If you want to be successful at it, you'd better love what you're doing and you better love the people you work with. Don't try to heat an oven with snowball. My friend, I have heard literally thousands of speeches in my lifetime. But if Will Rogers, bless his great heart, was standing here today and wanted to give us a directional compass for the next year, and if he wanted to expound on this second great principle of human engineering, loving what you're doing, I don't believe he would veer one word from the last admonition he made. You better love what you're doing, and you better love the people that you work with. You know, I, mean, I uh, think that if I pick five sentences from his great speech, I believe I'd pick these five, and I think they're about as great as anything I've ever heard in my life, unless maybe Winston Churchill's great speech when he swept up a nation in one great heartbeat. Listen to what he said. Every word he said applies to us here today. He said, it is as difficult to separate the love of your work from the love of people you work with as it is to separate the sun from the sunshine. He said, there's a law of life as strong as the law of gravity. If you want to live a happy, a successful, and a fulfilled life, you got to learn to love people and use things. Don't use people and love things. He said, what do you think would happen right now if everybody in the world knew they had only 10 minutes to live? He said, I don't know either, but I know one thing. Every telephone booth in America would be jammed with people calling somebody to tell them what? I love you. He said, why do we try to hide the most divine impulse God gave us? Do we think it's sissy? Do we think it's effeminate? Remember, he jumped in a chair and flexed his muscles. He said, look at me. Do I look sissy? Do I look effeminate? He says, answer me. He said, you better not think so, brother. I can lick any man in the house. And I think he could. 
You know, he used to be a professional fighter before he became a cowboy. Then he smiled gently and said, and I don't mind, I don't mind saying, I never met a person in my life I didn't love. He said, every stranger is just a friend I haven't met. Then he made the greatest remark I've ever heard in my life, and I've never heard it repeated. He said, the Bible says love your enemies. He says, just for practice, why don't you try it out on your friends for a while? I love old Kettering's statement. He says, I don't want a person who's got a job. I want a person whom a job has, has so completely. Last thing he thinks about at night, first thing he thinks about every month, sitting on the side of the bed, begging him to wake and rise and fight to win. Maybe you saw in Reader's Digest not long ago the story where the doctor walked in and three little kids were waiting for their diphtheria shot. He walked up to little Johnny looking at popular mechanics and he said, Johnny, what you going to be when you grow up? Johnny said, I'm going to be a mechanic. I'm going to fix autos, make airplanes fly. Went over to little Tommy looking at field and stream. Asked him the same thing. Tommy said, I'm going to be a god. I'm going to take people where the fish bite, where the game high. Then he went over to little red-headed Billy who was looking at Playboy magazine. He said, Billy, what you going to be when you grow up? Billy scratched his head. He said, Doc, I don't know what you call it, but you know I just can't wait to get started. <laughs> My friend, let me ask you something. When you wake up in the morning, are you so in love with what you're doing you can't wait to get started? My friend, if you're not, I'm sorry. You better take an inventory of yourself because you got a ticket in your pocket. It says, I'm just passing through. So often people will tell me, well, that's all fine and good, but if, if I could find something I love to do, then I know I do well. Oh, no, my friends. You learn to do something well, and then you love it. Someone asked old Michelangelo one time, said, look, Mr. Angelo, uh, it must be great you get that great divine inspiration. You go out and you create Moses, David. He said, it doesn't work that way. He says, I go out and I work, I slave, I go through the tortures of the damned. I sometimes take a whole year creating something, tear it down, start all over again. Finally, I'll do something I'm proud of. Then I get that divine inspiration. Oh, my friend, look, please let people know you love what you're doing. I have an old dog called Sam. We don't know what kind of dog he is. He's a dog of very careless parentage. He won't hunt. He won't point. Watch, dog. You could steal everything you got. Sam would help you carry it out if he could. <laughs> and yet I wouldn't sell that no-cat dog for all the money in this room. And I'm going to tell you why. I come home at night tired, out of sight, so it. My wife's too busy to meet me. Kids off playing. Not old Sam. That confounded dog will sit motionless for five hours in front of that door waiting to see me. The minute I open that door, his old public relations department starts wagging. He makes me feel loved and wanted. But he reminds me of this second great principle of human engineering. And don't you forget it. The world is a looking glass and gives back a reflection to every person of his own image. I was telling about Sam in Milwaukee the other night, and someone came up to me and said, Mr. Robert, look, I'm a toastmaster, a postmaster. I've been a postmaster for 19 years, and not until the night has it ever occurred to me why I have to look into the eyes of two or three people every day to know how I feel. Oh, my friend, we're responsible for the reception we get. You've heard that old story, old whiskered story about the two guys that went up to the gates of the city. The first one went up, what kind of people you got in this city? Well, what kind did you have back home? Oh, they were lousy people. Cheats, thieves. People in the veins of milk of human kindness had clapped. In fact, I left to get away from the old crowd. Well, I'm sorry, my friend. You better go on down the road because that's the kind of folks you're going to find here. He went on softly down the road. Next guy came along and asked the same question. What kind of people do you have here? He said, what kind do you have back home? Oh, they're lovely people. Kind, compassionate, unselfish. It broke my heart to leave. Don't you worry, friend, you come right on in. That's the kind of fine people you're going to find here. If you could ever master this great principle of human engineering. You say, what has this got to do with selling? Huh? What has it got to do to selling? Just about 85%. If you'd ever enter this exciting world of human engineering and just try these a while, you wouldn't believe the revolution that would come over your whole life. You know, I was recently asked to speak to... <clears throat> the executive committee of one of the large railroads and they had some of the officers and managers in so i uh, wanted to find out a little bit about the company and there was a book on the history of this uh, railroad and i picked it up and the second president was a fellow by the name of walter winston and the story goes that he was going through a little town in arkansas and he was on his big beautiful presidential car with his feet all propped up 
smoking a big cigar, 